For the Los Angeles Review of Books, I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from Santa Monica, California, speaking today with Mona Simpson, the author of books from Anywhere But Here, to Off Keck Road, to My Hollywood, to the new one, Casebook, which is a book written in the voice of... Of a young boy, a young, a young boy becoming a man, you might say. You could call it a coming-of-age novel in that way. And this boy, Miles, is different from me in a very specific way I was thinking about. Because a while ago, a friend of mine who's my age was saying, growing up, his mom kept a diary. And his mom kept this diary. She kept it, and she kept it in the living room. She had the diary out there for anybody to read. So my friend, growing up, would occasionally just dip into his mom's diary for... Uh, amusement edification, a way to pass the time, I don't know. But he enjoyed doing that, and his mom knew he was reading it, and it was just sort of like, here's my mom's diary, I'm reading it. To me, that idea is horrific. The idea that... I, I, the, I, reading your mom's diary is like... I, I'd rather get a root canal every day, you know? Miles would read his mom's diary, right? He would, although I think he's somewhere in between you and your friend. First of all, I'm curious what your friend found in his mother's diary. I, I didn't ask. The concept, I don't know. The concept is unacceptable to me somehow. I mean, you've seen the spectrum of opinion, right? Miles, your character, wants to know more about his parents. I don't not want to know about my parents, but there's something about the personal things of your parents. Either you want to, either you want to co- have contact with those or you don't, right? I think that's for sure true. I think mostly you don't. I think mostly you want them to remain in their in their roles, right. um, in their codified roles. But I think what you know, and 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 also I think we should probably differentiate between a kind of public diary, which it sounds like your mom's your friend's mom had. Yeah, she was okay with her son reading it anyway. Right. So she was obviously writing it in a certain way. I mean. That almost seems like a, you know, a blackboard in the kitchen that says, hello, family, you know, today we're going to do this. But, um, but Miles actually starts out snooping really for, for pretty benign and ordinary purposes. He's hoping to find out about what the rules will be regarding television and Game Boy and the various electronics he'll be allowed to use. He's... He, he wants to know the system so as to better play the system. So as to better play the system, exactly. He feels his parents are a little bit on the on the troglodyte side. He he would like them to be less ludictic and allow him to to be more um, independent in his in his viewing. But um, he starts out hacking for that purpose and ends up hearing things that disturb him. And so he's both sort of drawn in. Um, with a sense of protecting his family, and which he's, he ultimately is, is is unable to do, but I think he's kind of unwillingly drawn into a, an obsessive curiosity. He soon figures out in this way, through his surveillance, through his eavesdropping, that his parents are splitting up, they're getting divorced, but this is not really... Not only is it not a movie divorce, it's not in some sense a novel divorce in a way. It's, it's not a dramatic split up. There's no, you know, I'm done, I'm through with this. There's no throwing of plates. It's almost an anti-dramatic divorce, you write, is it not? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's, you know, you could say it's, it's a kind of a modern divorce. Although the divorce isn't even most of what he finds. He's, he's, he's then worried about how his parents are post-divorce and... And more, more kind of uh, disturbing, complicated mysteries emerge from his, from his investigations. It's true. The investigations, the investigations make Miles more suspicious. The more he learns, the more suspicious he gets. The more suspicious he gets, the more he and his friend Hector want to know. It's a, it's very much a feedback loop, right? Right. And there also there's two of them. Yes. So it's a little, it's different than if you had been alone doing this. There's something about, about two people together on a mission. That Not it's, feedback it, loop, too, between them. Right. And it becomes, it takes on a life of its own. It, it becomes a project for them. Reading this book, I at first expected the surveillance to maybe come to nothing. Maybe he reali- maybe Miles realizes his parents are splitting up and, you know, whatever. They go their separate ways. He grows up. He puts away the sort of silly puttied old phone that he used to tie into the phone lines and listen every night. But no, he, he begins to suspect that the new man his mom is seeing is some kind of liar. And it, 
Miles seems paranoid for a long time. But, indeed, the new man turns out to be worthy of suspicion. He has earned that suspicion. But at the same time, this, this fellow, this new fellow Eli that his mom's seeing, that Miles suspects is a liar, is a, is a cheat, uh, or, or even worse, he is also not a super dramatic figure. He's very mild, and there's a way in which his psychopathy plays sort of mildly, doesn't it? This is not... He's not... He's not a killer. There's no skulls in the basement, right? No. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> yes. no, that we know of. That, that you wrote in the book. Not in this book, anyway. <laughs> yes. It's, but this is like the divorce. The divorce is not fiery. And the villain, as Miles calls him, is not mustache twirling. I mean, nothing... Do you, were, you, were you writing this book with the idea, of, first and foremost, nothing was going to be heightened? I think this is sort of location of, of heightenedness or of drama that that one wants enough drama to keep the reader excited or, or turning the pages. But I don't know. I, as a reader myself, I don't want to feel manipulated. Yes, of course. Yes. So you don't want to feel um, that drama has been kind of pumped up. You want it to be there, but um, maybe a little bit off-kilter or surprising, ideally. It's true. It reminds me of, I don't know if you saw Richard Linklater's latest movie, Boyhood, that follows the boy in real time growing up. The actual actor grows up as the boy grows up. That, that aspect of it, seeing the actual yes. actors that's, change, that's amazing. That's, that, something that, that's something you can't do in a book. It's true. It's, it's the most sort of visually or obviously notable aspect of that film. But also, and this is also discussed, it's not an observation unique to me, that in Boyhood... The drama of boyhood is made up of the undramatic moments. It's, there's a few that are somewhat harrowing, but it seems deliberately crafted out of the sort of lulls, and those tell the story. And there's a sense as well, I mean, I don't know if you and Richard Linklater were subconsciously drawing from the same psychic storytelling well here, but there is a way in which the lulls tell more of the story than, these, than the moments of uh, out-and-out conflict, yes? Hmm. I don't know. There's 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 some conflict in this story, but um, I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, of course, what what Linklater used so well, I thought, was the was really the the actual the fact that he had those same actors and we saw them age. There's, yeah, there's it's sort of like the drama inherent in. I remember once Alan Gorganis told me I was I was reading um, The Lover. And he said, you know, the real drama of this story is how the narrator is now this face on the cover, which is this woman in her 70s or something. Um, and that's fabulous. I think in, in this book, you know, what, what you do have is you have a... What, or in any fiction, really, what ideally you have is you have an internality that substitutes somewhat, or, or that we need internality to do the work that having the same actor that that kind of verisimilitude and seeing the person age before your eyes has in in a movie it's, it's true and this is a novel written in the voice of Miles this protagonist and I, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll go to you for the final answer on this but I did feel I was seeing him age textually in terms of the style of the text maybe that's something I just wanted to see in it but it felt like the text the style aged with him I mean, he's writing it. He's writing it from his twenties, but at the same time, he enters the language of his his childhood when he's writing about it, and it the, the language kind of grows up with him. That's something I wanted to ask you straight out: is when is he writing this book? Uh, when is, when is this book being written? Because, yeah, as you say, it's in his twenties, but there were moments reading. I, I, I did figure it out. I think he was about twenty six. About twenty six is when he went back and, and wrote this, because read the first half of it, at least, I was wondering, is he writing this in real time? I was wondering how far away the text was from the action, sort of chronologically. And is that a decision you made early on? You wanted it to be years and years on? It's not that many years. I mean, I, I wanted it, yeah, I wanted You're Meaning one, two, three, whatever. to still be young, yes. you know, young enough to still um, easily incorporate the lingo of childhood, but and, and his time of childhood. But at the same time, you do need a, a little bit of distance, I think, to to tell the story. Plus, there's the sort of this layer that he and 
his friend are still doing it as a kind of collaboration. Yes, we have annotations from Hector now that they're grown up. You know, these are the kids who are working together on this investigation, working together, making a comic book out of the fruits of their investigation. Now, Hector is annotating this this text that Miles has written. His account of it. His account. Yes, and was this always a text within a text for you? Um, a little bit, because I always wanted each of their... I always wanted their primary audiences with this to be each other more than um, more than some external reader or you know so so in that way yes a little bit I wasn't sure how they would we get a sense of the curiosity that Miles and Hector have about Miles' parents but are they are these are these guys unusually curious about their parents or about Miles' parents I feel like they may be in that way unusual. I don't know, growing up, did you know kids who, were, who really wanted to know what was going on in their parents' lives? You know, it's funny. I was kind of like that. I was a kid who, a little bit, I grew up with a single mother who was um, a little bit perilous financially, and I worried about her, so I was definitely interested in her romantic life as a means of sort of safety, really, as a means of, you know, is this going to be problematic for her? Will this be... Will this person hurt her? Will this person, on contrary, you know, marry her and allow her to not worry about her financial woes? So I was definitely a kid who was, but but no, I think I think it's definitely a, a, a property. It's not an idea. One doesn't want one's children to be obsessed with one's life. I wouldn't think so. No, and in fact, um, when my son wrote this book, read this book, his response is, "These kids are like, it's you know, that doesn't." It, it's completely unrealistic. These kids are obsessed with their parents. Um, so no, I think um, I think that it's it's a it's a particular circumstance that would encourage that. That would um, and I it, and it's not what we would call healthy. It's not. But then you don't take the sort of classically unhealthy route, which would be I don't know to have miles. Be, be sort of the defender of his mom, fighting off all other suitors because he subconsciously wants to be the man of the house or whatever. I mean, that's a simple route to go, and it wouldn't be a, a very satisfying one. I mean, what Miles wants to be, what he, what role he wants to play in the family is a little more, little more complicated than that, right? He doesn't just feel like he's ascended to man of the house, does he? No, not exactly. I don't think that, that doesn't seem to be him. What role does he think he's playing in the family, though? Um, I don't think he's thinking about it overtly, but I think he's, um, I think he's been caught up in a, in a mystery. He's, he's sort of been led by an obsession, and, and once it's begun, he can't really stop it. And in that way, Casebook has a lot in common with detective novels, but how much do you, how much would you say it really does have in common with that form, with the form of the detective novel? How much would you say you've used from that tradition? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes. I mean, I've, I've read, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I grew up reading a lot of girl detective novels and, and some, some regular, some adult detective novels too, but, so I'm not sure. I think it's, it's all just sort of assimilated there, but, um, I definitely wanted that to be a part of it, but not the main part of it. It has something else very much in common, to my mind, with detective novels, with some of the canonical ones, at least of the 20th century, a Los Angeles setting. And this is a city you've used fruitfully before, and it's one that I feel like the use of Los Angeles here has something in common with, with the sort of noir novel, because when Miles and Hector venture out from the west side, from Santa Monica, where they live, they're sort of they're in terra incognita. They get on the bus, and they're in the same county anyway. Uh, but they they can go within the city of Los Angeles to just realms unknown. I mean, is that is that a resonance you feel between this book of yours and between the sort of Los Angeles detective novels of the 20th century? Yeah, and and I think every every Los Angeles novelist, it's it's such a it's not only a, a sort of literary culture, but it is. We do live in so many layered cities at once, and and we. I mean, we blind ourselves to so much. It's 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 a fascinating city with so many layers. In fact, um, last I teach at UCLA, and last night one of my former students, um, whom I'd had 
I think when I first started at UCLA, maybe a decade ago or even a little more, came back to my class. And what she does is she she works at um, the main juvenile, um, I want to say prison, but she had a name for it. I think it's, but anyway, she works there. And and she she's producing a magazine of these kids' work. And she says most of the girls she works with are all trafficked kids. Yeah, they're all trafficked girls. And the stories she told were just incredible. And the stories they they printed on her online magazine. Um, and apparently the hopes for the incarcerated boys are much better because so many of these trafficked girls have been branded on their faces. Um, not tattooed, but literally branded. And deliberately so, so that they will not be able to sort of get back into mainstream life and become a, a nurse or, or something like that. Um, it was it was fascinating, but I just it it reminded one again of how much how much we're living in different cities at the same time. You know, we're living in different cities, and how much we're necessarily perhaps oblivious to half of what's going on. It's true. Uh, one at one point, Miles refers to himself and Hector as West Side kids, and it's not he's not complimenting he and his friend. Uh, by saying that, he's, he's describing in some way a deficiency that they have. What does it mean to them to be West Side kids? Well, I think they know they're, they're sheltered a little bit and isolated a little bit and very, very privileged. And these are not phenomenally rich kids either, but they're, they're you know, middle class and upper middle class kids, so they're, they're lucky. And they, they go to a school that is... I guess it would be thought of as characteristic of the West Side. What kind of a school do they go to? Oh, no, I don't think that's a West Side school. I mean, I think they go to a hippie school, which is which are, you know, common in L.A. And there's there's some in the Valley. But Oakwood is certainly like that. And, and um, you know, Northern California and New York. And it's sort of a, a kind of an urban hippie school. It's popular about now. It's true. It's, it is popular now, and it's... You capture it in the book, and you capture some of... How to put it? You capture this stretch of Miles' childhood slash adolescence, and this is, it's, it's a real set of years. What, what years, what stretch of years, what span of years does Casebook cover in this retelling? I think about, um, I think it starts in about 2000, uh, I think it's about the past 10, 12 years. I don't know, I, haven't, I had all kinds of timelines. I would imagine so. I was changing the timeline every three weeks, the way one does. But um, I, I, it's been a little while now, so because books always are finished, you know, as you know, a long time before they come out. So I don't any longer exactly remember the timeline. But for our purposes, the past 10, 12 years works just fine. More than that, actually, because I think the parents separate around... 9/11. So, so it must have been a little bit more than like 15, 16, 17 years. Because of that, several different things change at once. This change at once in Casebook, not just Miles, not just his sensibility, not just the events of his life and the status of his family, but the world changes. Los Angeles changes. In the beginning of the book, I remember seeing a mention of Blockbuster, and that was jarring because like Blockbuster, you know, they're, yeah, they're all gone. I've, I've watched them disappear from Los Angeles. Or talks about Game Boys. Even I grew up with those. And uh, by the end, he's got an Xbox or what have you. And one of my favorite ways technology comes through, the change of technology comes through, is his scheme of tapping the landline in the house stops working so well. They go on cell phones. You know, He only gets his parents' conversations when the juice runs out on the cell phone. He just gets bits and pieces. How, how important to you was... How important to you was not just that miles would change over the span of the, these years, but that uh, the, the setting would change and that the technology would change the world. The city, would, Los Angeles, has had a lot of change these past 10 years. Were all those changes important to you writing this book, or was, were they coincidental with Miles' own change? I don't know. I think, um, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles. So for me, Los Angeles has a um, an extra resonance. You know, I feel... I feel I feel confident writing about Los Angeles. I feel, for example, I lived in New York for many, many years. 
I don't think I can ever. I could never write about New York the way I write, the way I feel writing about Los Angeles. It, there's something about knowing a place, growing up there, and knowing it to the bones in a way, or you feel you do. So for me, Los Angeles is always a character. Also, I think Los Angeles is such a misperceived city that it's it's pleasurable to try and capture some parts of it. Of course, there is no real Los Angeles. It's such a big city, but, you know, my Los Angeles. Exactly. Every, I mean, whenever anybody's talking about Los Angeles, they're always talking about their Los Angeles. And, I mean, what are the misperceived elements that you find it most important to represent factually or factually to your Los Angeles when you're writing it? I don't know. That's a hard thing to address because you almost don't want to address the misperceptions. You just want to give something authentic. That's true. You, know? you don't want to think, well, the people think these wrong things, and now I'm going to... reaction to. Yes, exactly. and, I, and I think I think Los Angeles has has developed, since I grew up in Los Angeles, it has developed um, a kind of slowly growing confidence about itself culturally. I think, I think people even just, you know, people don't feel the need to defend it as much. It's, it's, if people misunderstand it, it's their problem, and it's kind of a well-kept secret, you know. It's, it's true. That's and it's something I've admired. It's something I admired about Los Angeles even before, is even when, even in the days when it was more derided, when it was more looked down upon. It's still people still moved here. It's like that hasn't slowed down. It's like, yeah. nope. People would complain about Los Angeles with their words, but with their actions, they would praise it. They would come here. They would spend time here. Right. And, there, and there's that conflict as well. And it's. It, what kind of a setting is a misunderstood city to grow up in? Kids feel misunderstood, don't they? I mean, does being in a misunderstood place resonate with the sort of misunderstandings people feel when they're growing up? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's. I think it's definitely. Um, you know, it's still a. It's still a less represented place. Um, it's very represented. I mean, there's many literary voices, there's many films, but it's still less represented than than a, a traditional East Coast city, than an old urban city. And so I think that, you know, like anyone growing up outside a capital, one feels a sense of um, disparity between one's what one's reading about life and what one knows in life. Is the city important to Miles at all, or is it incidental? He's a native of Los Angeles. Sometimes natives, this is just the place they happen to be. What is it to Miles? I think it's important to them. I think I see Miles as coming back to Los Angeles. He's now not in Los Angeles. He's in school somewhere else. But I imagine he'll come back. Now, what, what, is, what are the dangers? You're, you're writing, in Miles, you're writing a kid who is... He's not the best at school to begin with, and he's, he doesn't think very highly of himself. He's not particularly athletic, uh, obsessed with his parents, of course. But he's a kid that I think adults would call bright. You know, interacting with him. I remember growing up with kids. There are certain kids adults would just like, oh, that, that kid will go places. Maybe he's not, you know, so impressive now. But there's, they see some sort of spark within them. Is Miles one of these bright kids? Can adults see that in him? And no, um, I think the guy at the comic book store likes these boys, but I don't think their teachers necessarily have responded to them. Sure, the guy who hires them at the comic book store can see somewhere who wants to hire them can see can see what can he see? Well, he could he he could see they're like him. They're sort of they're passionate about this this nerdy thing that he likes. So he can see their sort of intelligence and their it's, to him it's not strange. You know how that is. But to his teachers? No, his, to the teachers. The teachers are not loving these kids, particularly. <laughs> what, what does it take... You know, I, I have started to ask, what, what are the, the dangers of writing a character like this? Because you want to... First of all, you've got to get in the head of an adolescent boy. And what's, what's that like? I don't know. That just sort of came to me with this book. So that seemed... That seemed appealing to me, but I could see that, I mean, it was a question of, you didn't, you know, with, with any character who's young, I think, you don't want to feel too locked in only their mentality. So you want to, I wanted to throw in, um, whether it worked or not, you're a better judge of than I am, but 
I wanted to um, have sort of little bursts of vision from from the adult world, little little windows where the reader would actually perhaps notice something with more em- emphasis than even Miles noticed it. Yeah, and that's one of the things that signaled to me that it was later. He wasn't writing this in real time. That he was that he had some even in his even in his recounting. I still sometimes wanted the reader to be ahead of him. Right. I guess. Yes. It's true. There's both the need to be a bit ahead of him and to realize that he's writing it from a more mature standpoint. And that third layer, that he's, he's, he's a more perceptive kid than perhaps most, even during the time of all these events when he's doing his, eavedro- his eavesdropping. I mean, does he... Does Miles have an inkling of his own abilities? No, not no. too much. <laughs> what does he think of himself during this adolescence that we're hearing recounted in Casebook? Well, I think both of them feel a sort of grandiosity and a sort of massive insecurity at the same time. Um, he knows what he likes. You know, he knows what he's interested in. He's, you know, he's watching it all. I don't know. I kept thinking reading the book, you know, how, how would this sound through the voice of Miles' mom or his dad? You know, we, there's, a, there's a way in which the more I got to know... Miles' parents or his sisters or anybody in his orbit through Miles. I sort of knew them more and knew them less at the same time. You know, for, for example, I'm not sure, even now I'm not sure what I would say, what kind of a man Miles' father is. It, I, I, I remember everything about him in the book, but what, he doesn't, Miles does not feel quite so close to his father as his mother, right? Well, he's living with his mother. That's one obvious reason, certainly. But as well, he doesn't seem to... His observations are of a different character. He's pretty close to his father. He does? Yeah. Um, But he's living with his mother. And this is, to some extent, a story about his investigation of a mystery connected to his mother. So it's a little bit more about his mother. I mean, at one point, his, his... he stays up late sometimes at his father's house, and at one point a letter comes under the door at night. So it intrigues him. But then his reaction to that, he's so engrossed in the mystery with his mother. But one of his sisters has a whole meltdown when his father goes away on a vacation with a woman he's seeing. And he realizes at some point that his sisters are in a way more attentive to his father's private life and the changes there, whereas he's been caught up in this particular mystery. They've split their duties in that sense. Yes, not consciously, but yes. yes. <laughs> the marriage of Miles' mother and father, such as we see it before it falls apart, that, it seems like one of those marriages or one of those relationships where it, how to put it, you know, there's there's that there's the message from uh, Miles's father to his mother. You know, I promise. What does it say? I promise to. Uh, I promise to make you unhappy, or something like that. What does he? What does he write to her? I promise to always make you unhappy. Yes. Ma- yeah, to always make you unhappy. Always, always make to you, make you unhappy. Always to make you unhappy. That's when, the, and that's when the relationship is in its heyday. He says that, and it's a signal of it's a joke. Yes, yeah, exactly. I know. I know. I'm not taking it seriously, but I'm taking it seriously in the sense that. That, how to put it? I'm. This seems to me like a kind of a kind of marriage. Perhaps I've seen more of these days, where it's. I don't want to say not taken as seriously, but it's not really approached as traditionally. You know, you can make a joke like that, or I remember Miles's father saying things, or him remembering his father saying things about how he he wouldn't uh, buy his mother jewelry, that sort of thing. It's it's almost has a it has a strange casualness this marriage doesn't it? I think they have a kind of banter, um, and and remember you're seeing you're seeing sort of the the later days of this marriage. So I mean one of the things that Miles is, and his sisters are very curious about is trying to remember back to the kernel of romance in their parents' marriage, which. They, they weren't around to see. Right, so they have right. to use... What, what do they have to use to sort of divine that, to figure... Stories, family artifacts, right. what we all have right. of that. This sort of human 
drive to figure out to figure out what came before us, isn't it? I mean, that's how much of that how much of that spurs on Miles's investigative impulse? He just he wants to know. He just wants to know the part he's not involved in, yeah, whether whether right. it's and before. before us and, and, and in a way, whether we came out of a. a a beautiful mistake or out of a, you know, some sort of arrangement. You know, we all want to be, we all want to be conceived in love. I suppose so. We, we all want that, but... But I'm not sure that he's really, at, for the most part, you know, on, on that trail, because he almost can't be. He's, he's really trying to figure out what's going on now and whether this family's going to be sort of okay. Right. And he does prove quite astute at that at the task of figuring out at least what's going on. I eventually, eventually yes, but he comes he he comes He's lucky too sometimes. I mean. That's true. He, he has a few lucky breaks, but for example, he he gets the free counsel of a of a private investigator, and this is one of those another fascinating element of the sort of youth of the main character that if he wasn't if he wasn't this kid. The, the private investigator wouldn't be helping him, would he? I mean, unless he, unless he coughed up money. Yeah, not for no money. What does, what does the private investigator see in, the, in these, these pair of 14, 15-year-olds who just want to know if the, kid's, if the kid's mom's boyfriend is cheating on her? Well, I think he's kind of... Um, there's several reasons I think he, he's sort of interested in them. One is that um, he feels... He's, he's got a, a pretty good profession financially, but he feels sometimes a certain lack of respect for his for what he does. And he really likes what he does. So he doesn't want to switch it, but he's single and he's dating and it's not a status profession. Right. He spends a lot of time checking up on reality show contestants to make sure they're not criminals, right? Well that yes, he he and, and also security issues for celebrities, but he feels that when he meets women, it's not it, he's not considered sort of professional enough. And so these boys are have admiration for what he does and respect. So that's appealing. But also, he had a relationship with a woman whose whose son he was close to, and that broke up. And then he was not in touch with his son anymore. So he's also kind of glad to have these boys in his life for that reason and that he, he misses he misses the boy he was helping to raise there's this moment when Miles is writing about this private investigator Ben Orion talking about observing or noticing putting a few clues together noticing the way Ben Orion talks and thinking about uh, his alma mater uh, Sacramento State and saying that that was a moment he an early recognition of what class was that this private investigator was from a different class than him. I mean, how much, how much of this coming of age story is also a, a story of class awareness? Because I mean, that's a hard concept to get a handle on in America or in a city like this, right? Well, it is and it isn't. Um, you know, I mean, they're trying to put things together, and this private investigator is a really smart, good-looking guy, and yet he's having. You know, he doesn't seem to have a girlfriend. So they're sort of perplexed by that. They're trying to figure out the pieces. They're trying to figure out what what that means. I mean, this is at the same time, they're thinking of class in that context, but also realizing that they're West Side kids, realizing they have certain privileges. I mean, they're trying to figure out the hierarchies of everything. Can we say that? Yeah. Do they have a curiosity about that, or is it just something that falls upon them, these realizations of hierarchies as they're going about their business trying to satisfy their curiosity? No, of course they have a curiosity about that. They frame it in ways that see that, that are quintessentially adolescent boy-type framings, as you say. Like, why doesn't this guy have a girlfriend? That's what they wonder about. And that leads to a realization about class. Well, that's what alerts them, uh, because cause the other class markers, he does have a pretty nice place where he lives. And so the other things that would trigger that curiosity aren't there. That's, what, that's, the, that's the piece that doesn't fit. It seems to me the essence of, in a novel like this, with characters like these, you want to get, you want to get at what they notice, what kind of things they're likely to notice. And I want to know more about your process of 
getting into the headspace of what adolescent boys notice i guess i guess for lack of a better word i mean of course there's easy directions to go with that of course they they notice girls and whatnot but one of the things i like about miles about the way he reveals himself is that he's not a caricature of a girl obsessed adolescent boy in this book he's not even sure what sexuality he has there for a while i mean there's it's a more it's a more nuanced portrait of that i think a more real one but what, what, what about him? I mean, because he says he talks about not being so sure what his sexuality is when he's getting to be fourteen, fifteen. That seems like a little late to be becoming aware of that, doesn't it? Um, it may be, but it it seemed right for him. Right. It seems the true thing for him, and 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 his friend, I think, still isn't really resolved. I think they're they're kind of. Um, they're kind of on the fringes of the social world in their school. And so the social sexual pressure is almost a little bit too much for them. And also I, I sort of perceive them as being, in a way, there's a kind of position of certain, how can I put it, there's, there's something I've observed a lot that's not easily capturable or, or definable, but there are a number of men, say, or women too, but who, who may be heterosexual in the way they live and may even be, you know, sexually heterosexual, whatever that means. And, and I don't even know what that means exactly. But let's say that there, I mean, for adults, say there are many married people who are consider themselves happily heterosexual and yet whose primary emotional connection where all the juice is is not with their partner um, but with someone of their same gender I think lots of men for lots of men is the person they work with and for whom they creatively you know share that's and that's their main um, interest in life maybe things they can share with another man they work with that doesn't mean that you know, they're going to become gay or, or anything like that. Um, and, and many women, I think, particularly at the period of life when they're raising children, you know, maybe their, their closest, most intimate, thrilling connection is with another woman they can talk to about the things closest to them. That doesn't mean that they're... But, but I think that's the dilemma Miles finds himself in. He he's feels, I think, sexually sparked, perhaps, by, by a girl... But he realizes that the relationship he has with her is is quite flimsy compared to to his connection with Hector, which is his life almost. It seems like a mismatch to him. Then he's, this isn't. It feels like the not quite the way it's supposed to be for a while, right? It's like what's this is. Right, and so he's, he's wondering what that means. It's a common quality of adolescence, wondering why, thinking this is. This, this part of life is supposed to feel this way. It actually feels this way. And trying to bring those two things into alignment. I think that's a classic quality of, of adolescence and also what, we look for, what I look for to some extent in fiction because right. so often there's kind of an idea of how something's supposed to feel, but does it really? Right. You know? And it's one of the things I liked about Casebook that it doesn't feel like... We've, I mean, we've all read young adult novels... Uh, by not not by adolescents about adolescents for adolescents and I always felt like they were off even in adolescence they were just a little bit too it's like maybe the author didn't remember adolescence well enough or they wanted to simplify things but the the adolescence that Miles has in Casebook it does feel like those challenges feel a lot more real I mean is this is this a novel that adolescents should read? Or is it a novel better read to your mind when you're well past it? It's funny. You know, I... I don't know. I, I definitely sort of wrote it not specifically for adolescents. And I don't know if I'd want... Like, I, it, I think it depends on the adolescent. It wasn't a novel you were writing thinking, well, this is this will be this will be something somebody my Miles' age can learn from. Right? This will be my breakthrough to be to be John Green. No, not really. It's a lucrative market, I suppose. The young adult. No, I hadn't thought of that because there's some of the 
there's some, um, I don't know, there's some of the things they discover that I'm not sure you'd want an adolescent to be worried about yet, you know. Um, not so much the affair, but more the sexuality, I think, probably. And that is the most troubling thing to Miles as well, is when he gets these yeah. notes of sexuality from the eavesdropped conversations. Right. That just, he just puts the phone down at that point. Right, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure when, I don't see it as a book particularly for adolescents, but maybe some. And that reaction... It's funny, none of my books, actually. I, there, was, <laughs> there was a girl who was a very, very smart kid who, uh, at one point, there was a reading at my kid's school that some of the parents who were writers gave and they they were quite explicit that this was an event for parents you know so I didn't worry about what I was reading I was reading from Off Keck Road and it was it was a passage that had some sex in it and it seemed fine for adults but I wouldn't have definitely wouldn't have chosen it for kids and one mother brought her you know like 11 year old and I was just oh no and then the kid loved it you know it was really fascinating to her so then she wanted the book and I sort of had to say to the mother you know really I don't I don't think this is a great book for you, Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that gets at something else that I found unsatisfactory in, in standard young adult novels, which is that they don't give a lot of kids credit for what they can handle. This girl in the audience right. could handle what you had to read. Maybe, and was yeah. maybe, yeah, That's maybe. True. And then again, I mean, you know, kids now, I mean, there's just no, they, they see everything. It's often said, but, you know, kids learn more about everything sooner now. And often it's brought up as a huge issue. Is, is I think it's been sort of perpetual, at least over the 20th century. Uh, are, is is yeah. this generation being ruined? Is it bad for them? Is it bad for them? Yeah. yeah. But has any evidence emerged about that ever? I mean, to your mind even, is, is there a generation being ruined here? No. I think you can't ruin a generation too easily. Right. <laughs> I think we're probably... if. I mean, I think we're probably more ruined by... Um, by Instagram than by exposure to... You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. I've never actually used Instagram. I'm aware of it, but it is interesting because I... I already see a little bit of a divide between... Yeah, there's a certain... Every, everybody... The past few generations has all, has all, I think, wondered, how old am I going to be before I'm looking at kids these days and seeing how different their childhood adolescence is from mine? I'm 30 now, and already it's quite different. It's looking at a 15-year-old, it's quite a different setting than they're in than I was 15 years ago. It's it's its own it's its own challenge in fiction. It seems writing young people. Do you think the the rate of change in in just the setting of one's adolescence is speeding up as well? Is it getting unrecognizable faster? Is the kids these days age getting younger? How old is somebody before? How old does somebody have to be before they look at adolescents, teenagers, and think that is so different from the environment I grew up in? Whether it's the electronic devices or the sort of what they're exposed to. I so- it's where they grew up too. I mean, you know, it's funny. I teach at UCLA, and so the students tend to be. You know, of course, there's older students, but most of them are between 18 and 21. And even among themselves, they grew up in such different, really different environments and live in very different worlds even now. Financially, um, religiously, culturally. Those differences, they're maybe starker than the differences of when you grew up, is where and in what context. Because people always make, I mean, they make a big deal of how different the, uh, today's kids are from them in terms of their Instagramming and their tweeting and what have you. But... You're right. It, it has. It, it could. It could have more to do with the setting they grew up in, not necessarily the time. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, both. Both things. But it brings me back. It brings me back to Los Angeles as as a setting to grow up in, in real life or in a novel, and the sort of fear or bewilderment Hector and Miles feel when they go out into Greater Los Angeles, because it's fascinating when I meet people my age are a bit younger who grew up here you know there's one there was one girl specifically I was talking to a little while ago who's in her early 20s out of college grew up in Los Angeles has lived in London has lived in Seoul has lived around the world is very adept at navigating these other places but for example has no ability to say catch a bus in Los Angeles like in the way that 
Miles doesn't in the book. There's a sense in which sometimes growing up here, you're prepared for the world, but you're not really prepared for Los Angeles, right? Well, you know what? It's not Seoul and, and uh, for my one day in Seoul, so I don't really know Seoul, but certainly New York and London and Paris... Old urban culture is quite different to to learn how to navigate. I mean, I think it's easier to navigate the um, subways, and also you can in those cities you can walk so much easier. You, the distances here are, are substantial, um, but you actually can crack the bus code. Pretty, it's a pretty good bus system. Yeah, I use it quite a lot. But it'll be quite different when the train is done too. That's I mean, you know, we're all waiting. <laughs> but don't you think? I mean, I think there is something. Well, there's a whole book to be written by urban planners about this. Yeah, I try to read as many as I can. My friend Doug Seussman has written, written a wonderful book. There is a different feeling to a bus and a train. Um, you know, just the speed involved. I myself like buses, but then I like to read on the you know on the bus. But but you know, of course, people's relationship to Los Angeles often involves cars, and that that probably will change for the next generation. But it hasn't changed yet. It's, do you drive? No, I, I don't. I don't have a car. Um, do, you, do you drive though? I mean, do you have a oh, license? I can. I, I I can do it. Yeah. Sometimes my girlfriend has me drive her car someplace if she's too tired, and I have no real objection to doing it. But it's sort of like, what do I have to do this for? You know what I mean? I know. I know. No, it'll change the city so much this, when the train is finished in a year. It's true. Uh, don't you think? I mean, I, I, I think mean, it'll, be, it'll be amazing. I talk about it constantly. <laughs> Usually I'm the one asking that question, so it's, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear it asked back to me. It's, oh, my but, God. I mean, to, to not worry about parking downtown oh, is going to be so great. Or indeed Santa Monica. Yeah. Well, it's funny. That's, uh, it's funny. I suppose you know the parking. In, or, or UCLA, from the, well, when we'll always have to worry about that a little bit, but cause it won't be that close. But, um, no, it's going to be great. Right. There's this... As you say, a, ge- a generation coming up that has different expectations for a city, perhaps in Los Angeles. They, as we say, they use different devices, grow up in a different context. But more broadly speaking, I mean, do you find how fascinating do you find Miles's generation? Is it are they are they different to the previous generation? There's all this talk of millennials, and I feel like it needs some deflation. But. Are the, is it, this guy's a millennial. I, I think... Oh, um, you're, you're talking about Alejandro Zambra, yeah, the author of this I, novel we have. And I'm, I'm also thinking of, um, you know, I, I always have students. So, um, I don't know, I like this generation. Mm. I think they're more courageous in some ways. I, 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 or my students are, anyway. I mean, such a small sample. But um, I think it's kind of promising generation. You know, I'm just thinking of last night in, in class and... I teach one night a week, and, um, you know, I have one kid who's a really hilarious, hilarious writer and writes a lot about, um, quite comedically, about religious, you know, the, the Christian group on campus and all. And yet he's a believer. And, and it's not satire in some way? In some way, very much so. But it's, it's beautifully done, and... and He's not at all sheepish about that, and 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 the whole class is is quite different and quite um, unabashed about their differences. Is that an element you have in mind when you're writing a you're writing a protagonist of that generation? I mean, I guess I guess Miles would be a bit older than the students you have right now, but is, do you think of them as the same cohort? Oh, I hate to bring out the word millennial, but uh, it's what the world has settled on. I know, I know. Um, yeah, I do think of them as about the same generation, or roughly. You know, they were all alive. They all grew up with, with 9-11. They all grew up, you know, post that. They all grew up with, uh, with technology. Contrast for me a little bit writing young people when you first began. You know, is it in that sense are sort of young people, young people, young people to you, or is there much of a difference? Well, you know, for fiction writers, we think a little bit less in groups, probably. I mean, so the, you have to, or else yeah. you're not writing very good fiction if you're thinking yeah, of groups kind of themselves. But um, but definitely, I think um, you know, I think people. I, I'm I'm a real believer in sort of living in one's own time period, whatever that is. I mean, I, I, I think even, for example, you know, lots of people are 
you know, if you have children, it's a very, it's a big concern of what what the generation is doing, and do you want to let them? And blah, blah, blah. and and of course, you do have to be careful. But at the same time, I think there's a danger too in in not living in one's time. What, what happens when you do that? I, I, I think you might be um, awkward or, or or unable to. There are some communal pleasures one wants to to receive. It's true, and especially in terms of fiction writing. I'm not a fiction writer, but there's a temptation, is there not, to try to step outside of the time, to fear that if you mention a Game Boy or if you mention a certain brand of cell phone that's going to date your fiction, and that's a problem, that, that temptation exists, does it not? Well, I mean, you definitely think about that. I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, there's, God knows there's lots of things that are footnoted in Proust. I think it, it depends on whether the fiction... It depends on proportion. I mean, you don't want you don't want to depend on those pegs too much. But they need to be there. I don't think they need to be there. I mean, some people write in a more fabulous way. I I I like a little bit of of um, of the grit of real life in it in fiction. Um, not everybody does. Some people write much more. You know, I mean, it's interesting to sort of contrast this kid. Um, who definitely uses names of rock bands and Simon and Garfunkel and computers and everything else. Alejandro Zambra famously, yeah, working cultural reference in. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, as, say, his, you know, the, it's definitely not the Latin America of the 70s of, of, you know, flying carpets and angels and avalanches of butterflies, It's, a, it's which is much more fabulous and much less pegged to a time period or... A specific real culture. Um, and one of the things that you work in from this time period, I mean, the, the last 10, 12 years, the span of Miles' adolescence, we've seen a boom in independent comics, shall we say. There's been a, yeah. a certain alternative comics movement. Yeah. Hector. Comic novels and all that. Yes, I love that. All those. And Hector and, and uh, Miles, they produce this graphic novel of their experiences, becomes a bestseller by the standards of those books, uh, or by any standard, perhaps. But. Uh, no. Or an indie, indie bestseller. Oh, I see. So it's not quite the stratus. It's not, you know, number one on the New York it's Times. It's not Mouse. Sure, it's yes. not Mouse. It's good. It's, it's a, this book, Two Sleuths, is a success right. by the standards of these comics. And you mentioned you enjoy these comics. And I want to ask you, how, how deep have you gone into that world reading of these, these kind of Two Sleuths comics? Um, I guess I've gone more into the graphic novel world a little bit. Mm. And I've enjoyed a lot of them. What are, you, what are some of your favorites? Well, I love Blankets. Yeah, Do you know that one? Of course, that's name-checked yeah. in the book. They, that's yeah. an inspiration for them, right, yeah. when, they, when they write I mean, there? I, there's, there's a lot of them. I have, a, I have a kid who's really, really into that. One kid who's really, really into that, and the other one who's really, really into John Green. Oh, I see. <laughs> Fair enough. Covering, covering both exactly. planks of that. One is a little bit older. One is 14. But What else have you... So I've read them both. <laughs> you've, read, you've read those. What else have you taken with you, you know, coming out of... Miles' world, what 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 parts of the culture that his generation is into have you have you sort of taken away with you after having written Casebook, after having lived in the world of Miles, the specific kid, the specific age, at the specific time, in the specific lot, place? Quite a lot. I mean, um, gosh, it's almost too much to remember, but it's certainly. Certainly, definitely, some music, some some films, some some graphic novels that I, you know, yeah, definitely, quite a bit. I mean, I'm I'm listening. Thank you. I'm listening right now to um, something on podcasts, for yes. example. I'm listening to that, which is apparently ubiquitous. Which this is indeed right now. Something called the Serial, yes. which I just love, which was recommended to me by a kid that age, and, and it's uh, now I'm completely addicted. And everybody is. Everybody is. It's <laughs> it's fabulous. So lots of things like that. There is the sense of <laughs> it's uh, it's such a cliche when say a teacher talks about or an adult a parent talks about learning from their kid, a teacher talks about learning from their students. Yeah. But in this way. You. It, should be, it should be two ways, you know, it should be. I'm trying to think of a less cliched way to say it. There's enough truth to it where it's a very valuable idea. But how to put it, it's, yeah, putting that wrinkle into it, it's, it's a two-way, it's, it's an exchange, it's, what, what is it really when you, when you, when uh, different generations learn from each other in that way? I don't know, that's just life. I mean, um, 
you know, it's it's a lovely thing too because. I don't know if you have friends who are older or friends who are younger. Do you have both? Yeah, I mean, I try to diversify the group. You know, we all try. But uh, yeah, I, I do have I have both of those types of friends. I mean, I don't know when I was thirty if I had a lot of much older friends, and but I do now. I sort of have both ends of the spectrum, and it's it's really kind of a great thing. Um, for example, I think it even helps. You know, you don't have children yet. I don't know if you will, but if you have children. You know, in some ways, you hope you'll have some similar interests. You'll have some overlaps of interests. And I found that teaching, you know, for example, my my younger daughter is a dancer. I mean, I, my younger child is a dancer. I have two two children, one boy, one girl. And she's not. She doesn't particularly enjoy books, for the most part. And in fact, I I packed up most of her library the other day because she had these this, you know, wall full of books that I bought, you know, before I understood what her interests were. And she was staring at them. And meanwhile, she has all these, you know, plaques from different dance competitions that needed to be... I thought, you know, and she's not a reader. And I'm much more able to follow her into her world and and enjoy it because I have 12 kids, young kids I can talk to about books who do love that. So it, it actually... It expands your world in a good way, I think. I've been speaking here in Santa Monica with Mona Simpson, the author of many novels, including Anywhere But Here, My Hollywood, Off Keck Road, and the new one, Casebook. Mona, thanks so much. Oh, thank you. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the LARB at lareviewofbooks.org and me at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Thanks.